Good morning. You know, I, for those of you who choose to worship consistently downstairs, there's something you need to know about our folks who consistently worship upstairs. And you guys upstairs, you know what I mean, don't you? You guys got to have your own fraternity going up there. And you think we don't know what's going on. They've got like breakfast buffet lines up there. <laughs> they, that's why they go up there. It's kind of like, and you can't see them, and they're fine with that. We're a church family, and as a church family, whether you realize it or not, you're impacted by the actions, by the lives, by the impact of others. And that's the beauty of being in a family. And there's sometimes you, because the family is a large family, there's sometimes that because of the distance, you don't understand the impact. And that's not a slam on anybody. It's just you might not come in contact with somebody. This past week, we had the privilege of honoring the life of a 50, almost 59-year member, 58 years and 11 months, uh, Dee Dunnigan. And as this week, as we were doing his funeral service in here, and it was, you know, it was grief mingled with joy, um, the finality of death speaks to us, doesn't it? And yet, at the same time, we realize that what we hang on is the hope and the certainty that the resurrection has provided, that the cross causes the sting of death ultimately to be nullified. And that's what we rest in. That's the hope that we have. I remember learning this principle years ago, and it's one of those obvious ones, that every church, every church is a generation away from extinction. You know, time goes by so fast. And this week, as we were celebrating the life of a 58-year member, um, realized that, you know what, the next generation is here. And, and we should never take for granted what was just handed to us. We've been handed a, a great responsibility here at GI Free. And I'm always reminded of that when we lose a saint who was a part of our ministry, who who it, it wasn't like this when he came involved. And, um, and so we can never take that for granted. We stand on the shoulders of those who have given their lives for our conveniences that we, we celebrate. So in that vein, let me pray for us as we begin our time and lead us in prayer. If you would, just bow. Lord, this morning you... You know full well what we're going to speak on because you have um, aided me every inch of the way as I've been studying this week. All of us, to a person, experience some sort of affliction. Um, we're, we're human. We experience pain. We experience difficulties. And there's reasons that you allow that. And so we want to learn from that. But before we jump into the passage and we begin to learn, and hopefully through learning we become different, we think differently, we, we behave differently. But right now there's probably every single one of us have pressing issues because of those afflictions that we, just by being human, we experience. Every single person in here is probably distracted. Distracted by the behavior of a loved one, Maybe distracted by the pain, physical pain that you might be dealing with right now. Maybe somebody's just going through just the loss. Uh, and it hurts. Even though we know those ones we lost it could be an eternity right now. The, we're not there yet. And so the pain is real right here and now. Maybe the job situation right now is a rough one. Right now where you're sitting... Pray for that loved one that you have in the bullseye of your mind right now that, that God would do for them what's impossible for you to do for them. Ask God to do that which it's hard for you to believe that he can do it. And by faith, just trust him. God, throughout our life, you're constantly putting us in situations where we have to trust. We would a lot rather be comfortable and convenient. 
And yet, when push comes to shove, that's not the best thing for us. The best thing for us is to trust in you. So this morning, teach us to trust maybe better than when we walked in this room. We invite you to do a supernatural work. We submit to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul was the revolutionary that gave missions credibility in the evangelical world. Paul was God's man. He was a unique man. He had a stick to to drive the gospel outward from comfortable confines of Christian gatherings. History needed the gifts he had at the time he came. Yes, he's unique. Of course, I'm not saying he did it on his own. God, in his sovereignty, handpicked Paul. God, in his amazing grace, empowered Paul and directed him. Sidebar, just real quick. Did you ever think that God has handpicked you for the service that lays in front of you? Every single one of you is in a different situation. Did you ever think that maybe God had his hand in putting you in the situation you are in? He has. Embrace it. Don't run from it. God has uniquely gifted you for such a time as this to represent Jesus in the place you find yourself. Don't miss that. Don't wish you were someplace else and think, oh, I'm just kind of biding my time cruising through this. God wants to use you in your situation right now. Paul had established the church in a place called Corinth during his first visit to that city. Uh, It's a visit that took place, if you're into this, into his, right at the end of his second missionary journey. He had three missionary journeys. He, he remained in Corinth, it's recorded in Acts chapter 18, for, he was there for 18 months as he established this church in Corinth. Paul would leave there, he would go to a place called Ephesus, he wrote them a letter, God must not have wanted us to have contact with that letter because that letter was lost, he talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19, but later he wrote a letter that was called 1 Corinthians It's the longest letter of his 13 letters that he wrote to believers during that church age as the churches were being established literally all over that Middle Eastern area. And so he wrote it around 55, 56 AD. The reason Paul wrote 1 Corinthians is because they were struggling. They were struggling in their sexuality. They were struggling with disunity. And so when Paul was in Ephesus, after he had spent about 18 months there, he received Uh, news, he received a good report that the Corinthians, they were doing better. That this whole idea of their sexuality, their disunity, they were really doing better. And it motivated Paul to write another letter to them. We know it as 2 Corinthians. He probably wrote 2 Corinthians about six months after he wrote 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I believe, is the most personal letter of all the letters that he wrote to believers that he was intimately connected with. During the next several weeks, I've chosen to study with you the book of 2 Corinthians. It's not dependent. You don't have to know 1 Corinthians before you study 2 Corinthians. I believe it addresses some of the biggest struggles that I see in the 21st century that we wrestle with, with modern day church. The people in Corinth were, they were now striving to live in unity They were learning to forgive each other. They were learning to value community, but there was a deeper issue. There was a deeper issue that they were struggling with, and I think it's a similar issue to what we all struggle with. I, I believe that we, all of us, because of the culture we live in, this is not a slam on anybody, I, I believe there's an overinflated view of ourselves. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought. In fact, I believe the gap between God's infinitude and our finiteness is so much greater than we can comprehend. Um, Infinitude, finite, what are those words? Well, we have limits. God is limitless. Um, 
we have limits and we're, we're confined to a certain space. I can only be in one space at one time. I can only be in one time at a time. I, I'm not, I don't stand outside of time. I, I, I'm limited in my physicality. I, I, I've got clay feet. I can only be in this area for so long. I'm physically limited. I'm limited in time. I'm limited in space. I'm limited in understanding. God is limitless. He stands outside of time. Time is not a boundary for him. He stands outside of space. He's not limited to one space. That's why he can be all places at once. And that's just kind of mind-blowing. God can be all places at once. I mean, we can't even comprehend that. And so when you begin to think about physicality, well, God is all-powerful. He's not a physical being. He's a spirit. So he doesn't, he's not limited to the way we're limited. Our abilities compared to God's are dwarfed. And that's an understatement. And what I love about when you begin to get into 2 Corinthians, the contrast that you begin to see between human weakness and divine power, it's a distinguishing characteristic of the book of 2 Corinthians. As a result of our skewed view of ourselves, we have... We struggle with, well, why don't we live that proverbial and they lived happily ever after? You know, we, we're victimized by Disney in some ways, aren't we? Where we, we see the stories and it's always, and they lived happily ever after. And you go, but we don't live a fairy tale. Because we don't live happily ever after. In fact, I'm always surprised People are surprised. We are surprised when afflictions come. When think, Consider this. No one in the history of mankind has ever been affliction free. Did you ever think that? I mean, we're surprised. Oh, I got a flat tire. Oh, darn the luck. It was like everybody's gotten a flat tire at some point in their life, right? Everybody's had a broken bone or a splinter or something. Everybody's failed a test. Everybody has, and we're so surprised when it happens to us. Oh no, God's picking on me. And it's like, no, all of us, none of us have been affliction free. In in chapter one, starting in verses one and two, Paul makes it clear who this letter is to and by what authority he's writing. Paul is saying, I'm I'm an apostle, and therefore I'm guided by the hand of God. Therefore, the words are the best words possible for application. In verse 2, he basically has a prayer. He's going, you know what, blessings to you for reading this, and he's talking to those in Corinth, but you know what, this book is now passed on to us. So blessings to us for getting, in other words, he's saying, we are lucky to get the words of God. Let me read to you. The first passage, I want to break this up in verses 3 through 11. And first of all, I want to look at verses 3 through 7 of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Version. I would encourage you, we've, and again, I, I say this about every five or six weeks, probably say it more often. Don't take the Word of God for granted. You have access to us. In a world where very few believers have the access that we have, and we take it for granted. You know, I mentioned D. Dunnigan, been here 58 years. All of those D. Dunnigans who this church is built on, and we take for granted what's passed to us. I think we take for granted the scriptures that have been passed to us. The gift of having God's holy word is a, it's a treasure, and people died so that we could have this treasure. So, um, you know what, encourage you. You know, we've always got the verses up here, but I want to encourage you, grab the old Bible out of your home and bring it with you. You know, nobody's going nobody's to check you at the door. Got your Bible with you? Okay, you're in. You know, it's not like a ticket, but it's just for your well-being. We get into the Word so the Word gets into us. I, I can never, I'll never forget when I was a, a junior in high school, This is where we're not just taught principles, we're marked by them, aren't we? And I can remember as a junior in high school going to one of those retreats that, you know, Daniel, you take kids to and you think, gosh, did they listen? 
you know, and I was one of those guys. Did they listen? And I can remember the guy who was speaking, and he said, you ought to have, be so comfortable with your Bible that if everybody in the room threw their Bible into a pile, you could blindfold yourself, and you could go through the pile, and you could go, oh, this one's mine. This one's mine. It's like an old ball glove. And so that doesn't say, oh, you're, you're bad. I, I just want to encourage you. Don't take this thing for granted. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierces to the division of joint and marrow. Discerns our very thoughts and intentions. It's like your best flavored candy that has application to cut through any dysfunction. And it ought to be something that you go, oh man, what a privilege. And I think that's what Paul's saying to us is he's saying, hey, it's a privilege to spend time in this. What a gift. What a gift. So allow me to read verses 3 through 7. Now that I've made everybody feel real guilty. Sorry about that. Chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Verse 4, who comforts us, comforts us in all our affliction. Comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. In verse 6, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are, or if we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. In verse 7, he says, our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. You know, it's one of those things, when Paul writes, he writes like a, like a vitamin tablet. It's so packed that you go, what did he write? Well, let's break it down. Paul gives two titles. He starts off, he gives two titles to God. The first title he gives to God, he says, God is the Father of mercies. And then he says, oh, yeah, he's the father of mercies, but I got another title for him. He's the God of all comfort. Now, which is he? Well, he's all of those. When you look at the word mercy, it's a variation of a Greek word that means to pity. To pity something, to care deeply for it. When you look at the word comfort, so he says he's the God of he, he, his great pity. He, he, he cares deeply. And then he gives the next title. He says, he's the God of comfort. And the word comfort means to be very close to, to be very present with, to be very near. Interesting that Jesus uses the word comfort as he called, he called the Holy Spirit the comforter in John 14, 16, meaning the Holy Spirit is close to our side. He is present. He will never leave us. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, in that moment, you became a child of God. And at that very moment, as a child of God, your perfect parent ushers you into his care and, and he relates to you perfectly. His mercy and comfort for you go beyond the capacity of any earthly parent. His mercy and comfort are infinite. We only think of mercy and comfort in terms of a finiteness. But God's mercy and comfort for you goes beyond the capacity of any earthly parent. His mercy extends beyond and is greater than your sin. His mercy and comfort go beyond any of your inconveniences, any of your afflictions. For years, many of you have sung the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You remember the song? It comes from a passage of Scripture in Lamentation, chapter 3, 22 through 23. It's, it's, the, it's basically a psalm of tears. That's what Lamentations means. Where Jeremiah writes these words, he says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. His compassions, His care for you never fail. 
they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. See, the biblical idea of comfort is a profound one. The Latin word for comfort consists of two words. First is calm, which means intensive, intentional, intensive. And the second part of comfort is fortis. It means strong. So God comforts us with an intensive, strong care that can't be matched. This God comfort is available to all followers of Jesus to be able to withstand any hardship. So when God comforts us, we, his children, in turn, are intensively cared for, but then as a result, we can intensively care for others. God cares for us, we can intensively care for somebody else. That's why it says in verse 4, look at verse 4 more closely. It says, who comforts us, that word comfort, who intensively cares for us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort, comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. So he's saying this, the intensive care that God gives you becomes transferable through you to others. That's why we can confidently say, God doesn't waste pain. You experience pain, God comforts you. God doesn't waste that pain because now you're enabled to comfort someone else. And don't miss the word affliction in our study. The word affliction is, that, is a Greek word meaning to press, to press, to constantly suppress. Anytime the word um, affliction is mentioned, it describes both physical suffering and emotional suffering. Again, it's the age-old question, why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow affliction? This passage teaches two reasons why God allows us to experience afflictions. We in our 21st century Christianity, we in our, oh, they lived happily ever after, we think something's wrong when we experience affliction. You know what? Did you ever consider from God's perspective something's right when you experience affliction? The first reason is found in verse 5. Let me read it to you. It says in verse 5, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. It's a mouthful. What's he saying? This is what I believe Paul's saying. He's saying when we experience affliction, it allows us the privilege of sharing in the suffering that Jesus experienced. Now, please understand, Jesus' suffering by our human standards was immeasurable. What Jesus suffered by our humanity is immeasurable. We couldn't, we um, couldn't have endured what Jesus suffered through because when Jesus suffered, the emotional weight of the sin of the world was on his shoulders. Jesus suffered physically, but he also suffered emotionally because the physical weight, when he was on the cross, he carried all of the sin of the world on his shoulders. There's no way we could have endured that. We would have crumpled under it. But God allows us to suffer because the suffering we experience allows us to be able to relate in a small way to Jesus. See, our pain it's a remnant of what Jesus went through. But it leads us to be thankful to him for what God ultimately endured for our well-being. So look at it like our physical pain, our physical affliction is a visual aid that causes us to realize when we experience affliction, we go, God, this is just a remnant of what you experienced. And it motivates us to go, thank you that you suffered for my eternal well-being. You suffered so that death could no longer have an eternal sting. And so the, the first reason God allows us to experience affliction is because it causes us then to be able to relate to Jesus. It, it's a visual aid that causes us to go, Jesus ultimately suffered for our eternal well-being. And it causes us to be thankful in the midst of the suffering. I, uh, the second reason 
I believe why God allows us to experience afflictions from this passage is found in verse 7. Let me read to you verse 7. He says, And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. You know what I think he's saying? He said, we would never relate. We would never understand. We would never experience God's comfort, God's intensive care, if we never experienced afflictions. We would never know the comfort of God had we not experienced affliction. We'd never know God's comfort is far greater than any affliction that we can or will experience. Had we never experienced afflictions, we would have been shut off from that part of God. We would have never experienced the new mercies that God could bring every morning. We would be numb to how faithful God is. Let me paint the picture this way. Hypothetical scenario. What if, big what if, what if I could go back in my life, and my history, and have the option of trading all the afflictions I have ever experienced as if all of my afflictions that I've ever experienced, any stubbed toe, any, um, any difficulty, any physical pain, any emotional pain, any, any sort of affliction, we could just go back, we could wipe it out. What if you, in your history, you could go back and every single physical, mental, emotional, spiritual affliction you've experienced, you could just wipe out? You with me? Would you do it? And before you consider answering yes to that, to take away all of our afflictions, there's a cost that comes with that. See, if we choose to erase all affliction, no pain, no disappointment, no loss, no heartache, then we would also have to erase our memory of all the comfort from God that we have experienced If that was possible, would you do it? Tempting. Take away all your hurt and pain. But here's the cost. If you could erase all of your affliction, here's what your life would be. You would think more highly of yourself than you ought. Your life would be self-centered. Nothing would go wrong. Your life would be a life of convenience. You would never be in need You would never feel an urge to cling to someone outside of your existence because, why? Your existence is fine. No afflictions, no needs. No needs, all you're left with is just your wants. You realize that? You take away all your needs, well, then all you've got is your wants. And your wants would be satisfied. God would be your cruise ship director, making sure that you got what was desired next. But because you have experienced afflictions, those afflictions come in the form of pain and loss and inconvenience and sorrow and persecution and insults and calamity and failure and misfortune and difficulty. All of us, when we experience those, we cry out for help. And then in that privileged moment, God, the God, intensively cares for you in a way that goes beyond human reason. And you experience, you know that God's presence in the midst of pain is greater than any accomplishment or any earthly convenience. No way. No way. If you examined it, if you were really honest... You wouldn't trade all the comfort you've experienced in God for all the conveniences that you have been romanced by. You will never know the comfort of God till you have experienced affliction. And that's why Paul can say later on what we looked at last week in chapter 12 where he says, you know what, no. The afflictions I've experienced, I'm good with them. Because he couldn't escape. The comfort of God was too sweet. Let me personalize it a little bit more. Look at it another way. From my own experience, afflictions come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I remember as a child, 
remember waking up in the middle of the night. Your room is dark. You feel feverish. You've got one of those earaches that only a preschooler can relate to. You remember those? You wake up, you're hurting, you cry out. Who did I cry out for? I cried out for my comforter, my mom. Do you remember those moments? And my mom would come into the room, not in a way like, gosh, would you keep it down? You are killing my sleep. She walks into the room. She bursts in the room because she cares. Her child that she cares for is going through some discomfort, and she knows exactly what to do. She gets those eardrops, puts a couple in, puts that little piece of cotton there, maybe a warm cloth. But man, when you look back on it, it's not the eardrops. It's not the warm cloth. It's your mom's presence that makes a difference. And she stays there until you go to sleep. And you realize in that moment, your comforter is greater than the pain. I remember as a sophomore in high school, I played football during a period of time they taught you to tackle with your head. (laughs) That's why I am the way I am. I'm sorry. Do you remember that? I mean, guys, you you remember that? I mean, it's like, hit some, put your head on somebody. And they wondered why you had all these concussions. And I can remember a sophomore, I hit somebody, and then I'm getting up, and, you know, it's kind of like, hello. You know, and you can't remember people's names, and you know where you are. And I, I can remember my dad was a nurse in the Army, and so my dad understood a concussion, and he realized that, you know what, they're there can be some bleeding, and so there was this fear of if you fell asleep for too long, you would drift off into a coma, and so I can remember going to bed at night, and this head, horrible headache, and my dad sitting in that chair in my room, and he would wake me up about every hour and a half or so to make sure I was okay, and then, you know, occasionally he'd wake up, and there's my dad in the chair. He would be there when I went to bed. He would be there when I woke up. You can't erase that. And you realize that in the pain of this, your comforter in their presence is greater than the pain. As I look back on my life, would I look back and say, erase the earaches, erase the concussions as if they never happened? Not a chance. Not a chance. Because then you would have to erase the presence of your mom and dad at those moments of pain. And I wouldn't trade those moments for anything. Those marked me far more positively than the earache or the concussion marked me negatively. That's what Paul's arguing for. He's saying in the same way, God's daily mercies that are new every morning... They mark you for more more positively than the afflictions do negatively. Now, don't miss how Paul closes this paragraph. Let me read to you in verses 8 through 11. He says this, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, for our affliction which came to us in Asia that we're burdened excessively by, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope and, we will yet, and he will yet deliver us. Verse 11, he says, You also joining in helping us through your prayers, that thanks may be given by many persons on behalf for the, for the favor bestowed upon us through the prayers of many. Paul gives us an example of personal affliction here in verses 8 and 9. 
We don't know exactly what it is, but evidently he was in some sort of agony. He was close to death. Um, Paul clearly states that God allowed him to go through such an affliction. Here's the reason why. Verse 9, he says, because it happened to make us trust in God, not in ourselves. The reason God allowed this affliction, he allowed it so that we would trust in him and not in ourselves. You ever been there? Where you have, you don't, there's no place to turn. You can't trust in yourself. You can't get yourself out of this, whether it's a physical disease, whether it's a, a, a whatever it is. It's like, I can't get out of this. It, it hurts. And God says, I'm giving it to you so that you trust in me, not in yourself. And it's a privilege when he does that, and he does that for all of us. We don't like it, but we're not part of the Trinity. Evidently, Paul was so sick, there was nothing for him to hope in apart from the knowledge that God and God alone could help him in this one. Notice there's something else that this affliction produced. It produced something called corporate prayer. So... See, the affliction that Paul was going through that caused him submit to submit to God, that same affliction caused many believers to submit to God and to pray in verse 11. See, Paul was sick. He couldn't do anything about it. Not only did he pray, but there were lots of believers praying, maybe hundreds, maybe close to 1,000 in that period of time. In 56, 60 A.D., and as a result, 1,000 possible Believers submitted themselves to the only one that could change the circumstance. See, prayer is that privilege where we're asking God the Father to help somebody, maybe help us, maybe help somebody on the mission field, maybe somebody who's serving on the front lines, maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend. If you're human and you live in 21st century Christianity, as you prayed, you probably felt like, my prayers don't make a difference. Yes, they do. See, when you pray, you are joining the body of believers in submitting to the God who's the only one that can change circumstances. Once again, that phrase, God doesn't waste our pain. Here's why we can confidently say that. When you're afflicted, you experience pain. And God, first of all, comforts you, showing you that he is greater than the pain. We just looked at that. But second of all, when you experience pain through some affliction, well, the body of believers who know of your affliction, they begin to pray. And now, not only are you benefiting from your affliction, many people are benefiting because they are in submission to God. When we pray for God to intervene, We have to empty ourselves of us, and that's a good thing. When we pray for God to intervene, we're saying, God, I can't do this. See, so seldom do we pray. The reason we don't pray is because, well, I can do it. Why am I going to pray about something I can do? But when we pray, we're saying, God, I can't do it. Would you do for us what I can't do for ourselves? And when you hear of someone's need... And you pray that God would intervene. You're saying, you know what? I, 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 nobody can do this but you, God. You've got to do this. You've got to intervene. And as a result of that, you've got the body of believers. The family of God is beginning to submit to God. And then you begin to see God's not wasting pain. He's causing other people to pray. And in that prayer, we're submitting to God and corporately together in your house and my house and all over Grand Island, we pray for something. And then all of a sudden, all of us in our corporate prayer to God are submitting to God. By the way, we do others a disservice when we don't allow them to pray for our afflictions. There's some of us who are quick to go, hey, you know what, I got this situation, man, would you pray for me? But there's others of us that, oh, you know what, I don't want to burden you. And I understand, there's some, I was talking to a friend this week, there, there's some privacy that we kind of take on that, no, I don't want somebody to pray for this. You know, that rash is embarrassing, I don't want people to pray for that. You know, I, I understand that. 
But we do people a horrible disservice if they're going through something and we don't allow them to pray. Because you know what? Our affliction means they benefit as well because they have to submit to God. And when all of us submit to God, we're saying to God corporately, God, do for us what is impossible for us to do for ourselves. See, when you pray, you experience God comfort, that intensive care. When all of us pray, we submit to the one who can do what is impossible for us to do. So here's the application. First of all, rest in his comfort. The God of the universe intensively cares for you. Don't push him away. Draw on it in his presence. It's his presence that is the greatest care. But let everybody else in too. Let other people pray for you. Sometimes we don't share it because it's kind of a defense mechanism. Oh, you know what? That, no, I, you know what you're saying? You're saying, I'm not worthy of you praying for me? We're saying, you know what? I don't want to bother you. But you know what I think a lot of times is? It's a defense mechanism because if I share this with you, well, what if you don't pray? Then maybe I'm not important enough to you. And let it know, be known. Let the rest of us benefit. That's one of the reasons we, on, you know, when you have those contact cards in your bulletin, say, hey, prayer requests, because we'll pray for you. And as we pray for you, we can't, I can't change your circumstance, so we appeal to the one who can. That's why once a month we have the elders come up here and we say, hey, you know what, let us pray for you. Because we're corporately benefiting. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? First of all, there's no good people. Let's be clear on that. But you know why? Because God is greater than your affliction. And he shows us that in his presence. Let me pray. God, all of us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And in that dilemma, Lord, we think that we ought to have this fairy tale experience where um, we live happily ever after and we don't experience affliction. And yet you're so clear why, we, why you allow us to experience affliction is because if we never knew affliction, we would never know your mercy. So Lord, thank you for jostling us back into reality that Thank you for the afflictions that we have experienced. We wouldn't trade one of them because we wouldn't have ever known how merciful, how great you are, how comforting you are. I will never trade any of my afflictions for your comfort. And Lord, let us be realize the full potential of a body is so that we can share in the family a togetherness. So as a result of the afflictions that we experience, that all of us can benefit from those by submitting to the only one who can change the circumstance, and that's you and you alone. So now, Lord, we submit to you now in our giving. We submit to you in our worship song. Maybe, may we be different as a result of understanding from your perspective in our finiteness. May we understand from your infinitude the magnitude of why you allow us to go through affliction. And may it deepen our love and our submission to you. It's in Jesus' name that we've gathered together. And all God's people said, amen. The ushers will take up the offering now. I just ask you to remain seated until that plate passes you by, and then stand and join us.
sing with me. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy prayer. My life. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my truth. God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. You are dismissed.